Uh, good good morning. This is um, um, I'm, my name is Michael Bevan. I'm one of the Community Energy South uh, mentors. Um, so I've been working for, with Community Energy South over the last the last year. Um, I'll also be speaking about the Reading Hydro experience because I've been um, involved in Reading Hydro for for a few years as well. Um, the this masterclass has come out partly because we've actually had quite a few responses from people who are interested in in, in hydropower. Um, there is uh, hydropower was uh, was supported under the feed-in tariff, which um, is unfortunately now ended. Um, so a lot of the economics of it have 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 changed, but there is still interest from people, um, and so we are hoping to sort of uh, to help enable groups to think about whether or not there is a potential for hydropower in their area, and possibly to be thinking about what might what what might be required to help in, enable it to be to be um, coming in the future. So there's um, three speakers, myself talking, as I mentioned about Reading Hydro the experience. Um, we've also got Tony Cowling from Reading Hydro here, who is actually one of the founder members um, and basically probably the person, one of the two people who really, who would, who would have actually made this happen. Um, we, and then, Simon Hamlin from the British Hydropower Association will give a, a sort of a, a background to sort of the overall the policy environment and what's and and the uh, some of the challenges uh, hydropower faces um, and what can um, and what can what can be done to in, in enable it. And Steve Kelly is from the Water Resources Department um, Environment Agency, so he'll be talking about the permitting requirements for the hydropower. Um, uh, which which falls within the environment agency remit. So uh, with that, I'm going to hand over to Simon. Um, if if you're ready, Simon. Yes, I am. Um, have I got the screen? Yes, I have. Can we all see this presentation? Mm. We can. Yes. Good. Let me just uh, move all these lovely people out of the way. Great. Well, listen. Uh, welcome and good morning. And thank you very much for the invitation from uh, Energy South to, to talk at this um, masterclass um, from a very warm and sunny Whitchurch in Shropshire. I'm delighted there's people from Shropshire here, my home county, where I spent a lot of my time. So it's great to have all these people here. This presentation is really looking at the past 18 months in particular, about how the industry has coped with the pandemic in particular, and some of the challenges that we've had to overcome, which have impacted on community energy specifically uh, and all other types of hydro. Um, it's uh, not a focus specifically on micro hydro, but I will be covering that off. Um, just for your benefit, I've been um, at the BHA now for um, eight years. Um, I joined for, with a background from um, running membership organisations, so I've got 20 years experience of how to do it. The BHA as I put some notes on the screen here, is the representative body for hydropower in the UK. We've grown to an organisation uh, of just over 300 members, which makes us one of the largest, if not the largest, renewables organisation in terms of numbers um, in, in the country, which is a, a great achievement. Um, and we represent the best interests of all our members. And I think it's important to recognise as an association that we represent everybody from the single site water well owner uh, through to some of the, the big utilities, including Scottish Water, uh, Welsh Water, National Trust, uh, and many, many others, including Scottish Power Drax. So we do have a very diverse membership um, and we're the better for it. It helps create a more um, inclusive environment for hydropower and those people that wish to be involved in it um, and um, we look forward to working with all our members of, across the country on a, on a regular basis. We have a number of events that we have lined up for them uh, to help with our engagement programme, which I'll, I'll come on to uh, shortly. I thought a quick snapshot of the current energy trends. This is from Ofgem, um, and it's actually taken from an article in our most recent magazine that demonstrates there's about, well, 1,300-ish operational hydro sites, um, a significant proportion independently owned, um, and there's about 686 sites in Scotland, um, 
and sorry, it should be 231 sites in England, not 2,314. That's a typo. And 281 sites in Wales. There may well be others, uh, but they're not registered with, with Ofgem. So it, it was, as Michael mentioned earlier on, the feeding tariff gave a great impetus to the deployment of hydropower schemes uh, across England, Scotland and Wales. It didn't apply in Northern Ireland where they have a different mechanism to support hydro. Um, and it meant a huge industry was created around the feed-in tariff because when it started in 2011, the, the rates per kilowatt hour were very, very generous. Um, and there was a kind of gold rush uh, to build a lot of hydropower, which created uh, an industry uh, and a supply chain, um, both in the UK and, and overseas. Uh, and we saw an exponential growth of hydropower, which as, as Michael has touched on, um, may come to an end um, with the closure of the feed-in tariff. Uh, and I'm gonna start with the, the, the first challenge that we've had in the past 18 months, which has affected a, a number of our members, including uh, some of our community members and this was the feed-in tariff. Um, and because of the deadlines by which the feed-in tariff uh, was shut at the end of March 2019, um, members had two years or two and a half years, if they were community members, to build their schemes out. And because in March of last year, uh, for three or four months, the whole country was locked down, building sites were shut, supply chains didn't happen. Um, and a lot of members were really struggling to be able to work out how they could complete their schemes. By March this year or, or next year, or September this year. So uh, we had a serious, serious problem, um, which was um, exacerbated by uh, in, in, in insufficient advice uh, and help from, from government. Having said all that, we then lobbied Bayes to consider extending the deadline for a further 12 months. Um, we collated a huge amount of data across our membership from commercial schemes from community schemes uh, and asked BASE to consider the extension. Um, to a long story short, they did. And that extension means that um, people had till March 22 and, 20, uh, and September 22 um, of, of next year. So that was the first challenge. Otherwise, uh, there would have been a, a serious problem. And as you can see at the bottom, we wouldn't have had 70 new schemes, uh, 40 megawatts of capacity or 170 million pounds of new investment. So that approach uh, and that first challenge was overcome, has been overcome. And I suggest that by the end of March this year, uh, towards September next year, um, there'll be approximately 50, 45 megawatts of new deployment by the end of the last feed-in tariff schemes that'll be built out by the end of March next year or September next year for community schemes. So, that was the first challenge and Reading Hydro um, were one of the beneficiaries of that and, and Sophie and her team were hugely helpful in helping with our lobbying by providing a lot of the information that we needed along with a lot of our members including more than Hydro in Scotland which is one of the largest uh, community schemes in the country. So that kind of spec gave us a lot of thinking time uh, and helped us understand um, a lot more about how Bayes, Bayes operated. I think that um, on reflection uh, they did an exceptional job um, under very difficult circumstances and we're grateful to their help. Albeit, as, as, as Michael said, we were disappointed that uh, they shut the scheme back at the end of March 2019. And in fact, the way they shut it with a cliff edge closing date, which didn't help anybody at all. So that was the first challenge we overcame. And it benefited a lot of hydro schemes, not just our members, but anybody who is looking to build out a scheme at that time. The second challenge that... Um, some of you might be aware of and which we've been fighting for a long time is the issue of non-domestic rates uh, and without going back into too much detail um, in Wales and Scotland um, there was a huge increase in rateable values at the last revaluation which meant that some hydro schemes were being um, charged an increase of a thousand percent on their rateable values which in many cases made those schemes commercially unviable because all the generator was doing was generating power to pay off their rates bills. And we've been working on this to some extent for a long time. I mean, five years in particular in Scotland and Wales. 
Um, and because of the impact that these uh, hugely increased valuations have had on many hydro schemes, um, we lobbied the Scottish and Welsh government to um, create a relief scheme which would discount the rates payable in Scotland by 60%, which meant that basically hydropower schemes were paying 10% of turnover, turnover as their rateable value, which is in line with other technologies such as solar and wind. And that um, relief scheme, um, due to our lobbying, has now been extended to 2032, which is a great reassurance for a lot of um, hydro operators in Scotland in particular. Uh, Welsh Government had a, a domestic and non-domestic relief rate scheme, which they closed at the end of, um, on the 1st of April this year. And that has a very detrimental effect on hydropower in Wales. Uh, we lobbied Welsh Government harshly um, for a long time, but they weren't prepared to allow non-community schemes to take the benefit of the relief scheme, which means that uh, there are about, I would suggest, about 70 hydro schemes in Wales that are in, in danger of uh, becoming unviable commercially because of the increase in rates. But the good use for community hydro is um, they still have access to the relief scheme in Scotland, in, in Wales. So that if you've got a hydro operation in, in Wales, then you still access the 100% um, relief for hydropower. So that was, and that was, and still is a major challenge for all hydropower operators. In, in, in Scotland, um, all community schemes will get the benefit of the 6% discounted rate as well. So um, community hydro is protected in some extent, but for how long um, is, is unknown. Uh, but the third challenge, and I don't know how many hydro operators know about this, is the issue of um, the accelerated loss of mains program, which all sounds very technical, but it's part of the um, government's UK energy transition. Um, and the, this accelerated loss of mains uh, program um, is designed to ensure that all owners of generating sites in Great Britain um, make, need to make sure their uh, generation installation is compliant with a specific recommendation from National Grid. And we've been doing a huge amount of work to in, in, in make our members aware of these changes. Um, and it's designed to help the network more, work more efficiently uh, reduce uh, balancing costs and provide savings to consumers. So if you weren't aware of this, or uh, you are aware but confused, there is funding available until um, May of next year to make the changes that you would need to do with your generation equipment to be compliant with the new uh, regulations. Um, and if you need to know more about it, there's two links on my presentation, which I'm sure will be shared later on on our own website where we have details of the program uh, and also the ENA uh, website where you can actually find out about funding for making these changes uh, and the funding lasts until May of next year if people haven't registered for the funding and they haven't made the changes and they get past May then the change will have to be made but it'll cost the, the operator their own money rather than through the um, through the uh, National Grid ESO uh, programme. So it's important if you don't aware of this, uh, that, that you uh, log on to these links and find out more about it. Um, we did a huge amount of work with our members on this and I think the vast majority have now uh, made their systems compliant at no cost themselves. So micro hydro in, in, in detail, I mean, I've been involved with BHA now for eight years, as I said previously, and I just checking some statistics on my my system. Um, so far this year, I've had 109 inquiries about micro hydro. 109 in what in six seven months. So there is definitely a huge interest in in micro hydro. Uh, we know this because we work very closely with Community Energy Wales, Scotland and England, which are members of ours and vice versa. And we did a lot of queries, and I said 109 uh, queries about microhydro this year. And if I go back further, it'll probably be twice as much as that since 2020. So what do we do about these inquiries? Well, in many cases, there are people who've either bought a house 
next to a river, I want to know what they can do with the water. In some cases, they've bought a house which has got an old water mill on it, and they want to know how to renovate that and get it back into, into action. Uh, in some cases, it, we have um, businesses that are you know, saying we're building a, a, an office and we want to make it as green as possible. I mean, we've got a canal or a river going past. How can we benefit from that? So in every one of these 109 queries, I will write back to them. In many cases, I'll speak to them and ask them more details. And then where I can, which is most times, put them in touch with a group of our members from which they can select who might be able to find them with the advice they need to take forward these programmes. Um, if we were talking about a time when there was still a feed-in tariff, you know, a lot of these schemes would have gone straight into, into development because there had been the funding available. But at the moment, that's not the case, as, as Michael has mentioned and as I talked about. But there is um, so much interest in microhydro. I know for a fact that Bayes um, have been looking at microhydro. When I say looking at it, that's their words, not mine, uh, about how future microhydro could be taken forward. And I'll, I'll come on to that later. So there is huge interest. I know this, as I said, from experience by the number of queries I've had. And what's interesting is a lot of these people are, are, are passionate about wanting to use water to benefit themselves, but also to create green energy uh, and, and work towards helping to get towards our, our net zero targets. So in terms of microhydro and its profile, uh, it is still pretty high um, amongst our members, amongst those that can contact the BHA and within government. Uh, and I know if you speak to Community Energy England or Scotland or Wales, they'll probably uh, say the same thing. But the challenge they have is the same as everybody else's, is where you find the money to do the work that needs doing. So there is a focus on microgeneration and how we develop it further is, is one of the future challenges for everybody involved in, in, in hydropower, I would suggest. I think if you look ahead, some more challenges um, and opportunities. Um, so the feeding have closed in March of 2019. There's no immediate replacement envisaged, um, which we touched on. The last fit supported schemes were all built out by the end of September 22. And therefore the challenge is how you fund hydro schemes without feeding tariff. Now, we've had this discussion with BHA on a, a num numerous occasions. Um, most recently, we had a strategy day, uh, which I'll come back to. Before then, back in 2018, we had a workshop at our conference to ask members how they would go about building a scheme if they found the, the perfect combination of location uh, and head uh, and infrastructure and access to all the component parts. And it was a challenge because they had some seriously, seriously experienced developers there. Um, but they couldn't, they struggled with it, you know, because there's no feeding tariff. And an industry has been built around the feeding tariff. Once you take that away, all the people can talk about is, well, we haven't got a feeding tariff, so what do we do? Because the feeding tariff has been so successful, it's hard to imagine how you build a scheme without it. But let's not forget, schemes are built before the feeding tariff came along um, and before we had rocks. So it can be done, uh, but I think the environment nowadays is very, very different. So what we do at BHA um, is we do a piece of work with a, a, a consultancy company to try and forecast the energy requirements and pricing over the next 15 years. Um, and within that, identify where hydropower can fill in the gaps in the UK's energy mix, not just run a river but with pump storage and also with tidal energy. And that's a big project because what we want to be able to do is go to government and say, do you realize what you're missing out on? Um, and they will say, no, tell us and we will tell them. There is no point in going to government and tell them what they already know because they'll just disregard that. But if you can go to them with a new story backed up, for example, by National Grid, which we intend to do, it might well be a different landscape uh, to discuss the future of hydro. And there's two other issues that are worth kind of touching on. There's the local electricity bill. Some of you may have heard of this being run by Power for the People. And this is um, a piece of it's a private members bill that wants to be able to allow local generators 
to supply to local businesses direct, which you can't do on the whole at the moment because the cost of line, the lines is too prohibitive. But the idea would be, and I was a town councillor um, in Whitchurch up until the elections, we have solar panels on the roof of our civic centre and we wanted to sell our panels to the cheese factory. Uh, just down the road. We couldn't, but they were very keen to, to buy locally. And so the whole principle about buying local uh, for local communities um, is, is a very strong one. And we very much hope this bill will become law in the future. And the other thing we're doing, we've, we've formed a, a working group within BHA um, about the future of local distributed generation, which fits somewhat along alongside this. And we've engaged with Bayes directly on this, which is the same principle of allowing people to um, sell their power locally and bypass the costs of going through utility. And Bayes are very interested in this and they're, they're very keen to explore this further. So this might be an opportunity for the development of future hydropower. If you have a ideal site next to a local community that wants to buy the power, especially with local businesses, this could become reality. So it is a kind of chink of light. Uh, I don't think it'll be hugely valuable for large scale hydro, but on the micro scale, up to probably 100 kilowatts, it might very well be um, a, 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 good, a good thing to happen. So we'll have to keep you informed of how that progresses, but it is something that the BHA is pushing very hard on. We know Bayes are keen to discuss it and explore it further. So watch this space on, on that. And another challenge that we've been facing throughout the years, I'm sure you guys have, because we're having a conference virtually, is, is virtually engaging. Um, and last year we had to cancel our conference. And so we took a lot of those presentations um, virtually and that's been a great success. Um, we've had four presentations so far, on domestic rates, health and safety, funding innovation, uh, and the role of flexible generation and maximizing value through innovation. They've all been very successfully attended with a lot of interesting feedback. A future, future virtual events, which you're more than welcome uh, to join in with. One is through the Environment Agency and, help, and Steve Kelly has been hugely helpful in helping us organize three speakers to talk about these three uh, separate subjects. And then for those who are interested in, in, in uh, tidal range, we have a roundtable debate on the 23rd of September, uh, chaired by John Howard, the ex union was presenter from BBC, along with Bayes, uh, Environment Agency and, and others. So. The, the role of virtual events and virtual engaging um, is, is here to stay, although, although I prefer virtual than uh, blended, which is the, the, the kind of hip phrase they use now for uh, meetings that aren't always face-to-face -face, but include virtual. So um, we're not blending, we're virtual. And they've been very successful and I see them continuing. They're very straightforward, very easy to organize and even easier to attend. So if any of you are interested in knowing more about our virtual events, um, my email address is up at the end of this, this presentation. And then finally, just looking ahead um, from a hydro perspective, um, we have COP26 in November, um, which is the meeting of parties, um, climate change and all that, um, hosted in Glasgow. Um, and it's postponed from last year. There's still a lot of um, uncertainty about whether this will be virtual or face-to-face -face or a combination of both. Um, but the BHA will be there. We're not presenting. We haven't been we haven't been picked to be presenting, but we'll be there on a number of the days to to attend and see what's happening. And this is a critical time for UK government to demonstrate their green credentials because at the moment they're not doing a particularly good job of it. Um, and in front of the world stage, they need to kind of up their game significantly. Uh, to demonstrate what they're doing to support hydropower in particular uh, in the UK. With Bayes, we're looking at subsidy-free hydro support. So how can Bayes help us develop more hydro on a subsidy-free basis? And that goes back to the, the future of local distribution and also the project I mentioned about trying to forecast uh, energy needs and pricing. Tidal Rage Energy, I mentioned we've got a, a virtual event on that on the 23rd of September. And before that, the week before, we have a, a virtual meeting with the Energy Minister, Anne-Marie Trevelyan, to talk about tidal range, because it is one way of, of filling some of the gaps in the current energy mix, because tidal energy, tidal range energy, is the most predictable uh, of all, because the tides we know come in twice a day. 
And if that stops happening, then there's a serious problem. So tidal range energy has an important role to play in the energy mix, along with pump storage as well. And there's a call for evidence on pump storage hydro uh, come out, came out uh, day before yesterday. Uh, what's interesting, just briefly, is that people assume pump storage is you know, huge multi megawatt projects such as the Norwich. But in fact, there are a lot of people looking at small scale uh, pump storage, uh, domestic pump storage. And that's quite an exciting opportunity. We have the outcome from the CFT consultation, and I've talked about the future of local distributed generation. And then 24th and 25th of, of uh, November, two weeks after COP26, we have our annual conference where a lot of the things that I've talked about will be covered by a very broad range of uh, very diverse and very talented speakers. So that, that really is um, what I wanted to take you through. It, it does cover micro hydro. Um, I have to say that having worked with Community Energy England, uh, Wales and Scotland, we're always very supportive of the work they do and, and vice versa. And I hope that relationship will continue. I hope that the number of members we have from the community sector continues to grow. And I look forward to working with Community Energy South and we'll take any questions uh, at the end of this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Um, there was, there's been some uh, questions in the chat about, uh, I mean, you mentioned the title, but in terms of, are, are, are there any um, ex examples of existing projects, uh, uh, hydropower projects on using a tidal power at all? In the UK, no, they haven't. We've, we've, it's a good question. I mean, the, 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 just kind of going back a few years, uh, there was a Swansea Bay Tidal Lagoon project, uh, which um, was due to be co consented by UK government. Um, and a long story short, uh, they commissioned a report into tidal energy that was conducted by Charles Hendry, the ex-government energy minister, which basically said that it's a no-brainer, tidal range energy is an important factor in the energy mix. And his proposal was to start with a Pathfinder project that would help lead the way for future hydropower, uh, tidal race project development. That didn't, that didn't um, happen. Uh, the government decided not to go ahead supporting that particular project. But there are probably uh, at least half a dozen uh, tidal range developments on the drawing board at the moment, going down from the northwest right through the west coast down to, to uh, Somerset and, and into Wales. So there is huge appetite to develop these projects um, and there is a huge appetite within our membership of the Tidal Range Alliance which is part of the BHA to get these projects across the, across the line and that is why we're having these Tidal Range debates and meetings with the Energy Minister to ask them to consider uh, a development fund as they did for when wind first started to kick start a series of feasibility studies to make sure that what we are saying is factual and evidential because a good feasibility study can unlock uh, billions of pounds in, in investment. At the moment, there are no um, tidal range developments in the UK. The, the closest one we've got is the Rolls in northern France, which has been operated for about 60 years. There is one tiny one that I know of, and that's at Battlebridge in Essex, where there was an old tide mill operating there, and the owner of the tide mill has tidied up to a small generator. Oh, well. Wow. Uh, there, there's a lot of trouble, and um, people complain about him closing the gates and there's things slipping, but uh, he has got, I think, a six kilowatt generator tied to his own made and designed wheel. Uh, I, I did a dissertation on tidal energy, uh, and uh, I don't know of any other ones. Uh, that have actually generated electricity. Well, the one at Elling, in uh, just out south of Southampton, has an extra, has one wheel that grinds coal, but uh, grinds corn, but has a extra place where there was the second wheel, and it is possible. Uh, uh, I talked to them a couple of years back they were at least interested in the possibility of putting generation in that uh, second uh, 
place through the through the mill. Well, Nick, that's really helpful. Thank you. I mean, there has been a history, as you probably know, of, of tide mills around the coast of the UK for centuries, and there are still um, evidence of, of derelict tide mills. Um, and I know that one of our members has been looking at how they can develop these tide mills and re repurpose them uh, to make them work today. But um, there's not a huge amount of progress at the moment because I think mainly costs more than anything. But um, that's interesting to know. Thank you. I'm just going to take charge of this um, because yeah. I know we've got two or three questions, two or three people who've got questions they really want to ask. But I'm also conscious of time and that one of our presenters from Reading Hydro is only here till 11. So I'd like to propose that we, I'm sorry about this, Dinah. I'd like to propose that we uh, do the three presentations and then open it up to questions, uh, because, just because I want to make the most of our speakers. So uh, Dinah and Richard, I do apologize. I know you're there, I know you've got questions, and I'll, but we'll do them after the presentations if that's okay. So I'll hand it back to you now, Michael. Okay, all right, thank, thank you, then. Um, yeah, so um, I will then, I will, I'll now see if I can share my screen. And, okay. Okay, I mean, no, we're still on this position. Sorry, I've just got the... the um... Right. Um, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to present on, from, from Reading Hydro. As I mentioned, Tony Cowling, who is also here from Reading Hydro, um, and he's, um, he will come up, come up shortly. Um, so, this is, as you can see, this, this is Caversham Weir, where the, the site is built. What you're seeing in the background is uh, some of the large buildings, offices of offices in Reading. That actually, that building there, the reddish brick building in the middle, used to be the um, Environment Agency headquarters in Red for the, for the area. So very, very um, close links to the Environment Agency to the, in this project. Um, just a bit about myself is basically my background is funding and development. I've been involved in community energy for since about 2013 and I got involved in Reading Hydro in 2018, um, stepped down as a director this year. Um, so I was quite used to community energy and community, and, and, and community finance. Um, I wasn't used to hydro power. So there's a lot of, I, I did a lot of learning over the three years I was involved. Um, this is we. This is actually the Thames at Caversham in 1920. The View Island. You can see the weir is at the bottom of the of the photograph, and that's a similar picture taken now. And at the top of the on the top of the the River Thames, you can see the the space where the um, the turbines are installed. Um, interestingly, I think we said if we'd actually had that the earlier photo in the when we're building it might have been useful because um one of the comments was we actually hit the found that, that the house on the bottom of the of the, the island had, had disappeared and we fit the hit the foundations while we were digging trenches for our cable so if we'd known it was there we might have been able to avoid it um but it's those kind of things you don't have to anticipate until you're actually in in progress um just a quick summary um so the river thames it's it's over Caversham Weir, which is in Reading, 1.4 millimeter drop, um, an average flow of 37 cubic meters uh, per second. Um, and we've got two Archimedes screw turbines, 46 kilowatts of electricity, which basically about 320 megawatt hours per year. Um, we've got a supply agreement with the Thames Lido, or Lido, I can never remember which way around it is. Um, and we've also in, installed a fish pass on the View Island. Um, at Community Benefit Society, um, which basically is a lot of uh, organisations are, um, and that's enabled us to take investment from local people 
and and that art project has been entirely financed by through community shares. Um, as an indication of the timing of this, so 2013, um, this is when, um, and 2014, that was when, again, uh, the project started. Um, Tony has been involved since right from the start. Um, we, planning permission, if I was agency, like permissions were initially secured in 2016, planning permission in 2017. The project was then kind of stalled for a little bit until additional development funding was secured in 2018. And we then had a mad rush basically to get all the, to meet the requirements for the feed-in tariff uh, accreditation by end of March, 2019. So we had to get review, revised abstraction and impoundment licenses, which I think Steve, you will be explained more cl clearly within, within by Steve in his presentation. Um, and then the last year, effectively, we rate was used for financing. Originally, we rate had a target of seven hundred sixty thousand pounds, which we actually smashed. Um, uh, but in the end, we actually had to increase to one point one five million to uh, to account for cost increases. Um, we did run out. We issued tenders in twenty twenty, um, and our two main contractors were Land and Water for Civils and uh, stand by crop for tower generations. And we have been building over winter 2020-21 um, with turbines installed. And we are in the process of commissioning now. Um, there is the, the, the turbines have turned and have generated electricity, um, but they are but they're still in the, the process of being commissioning and sort of um, formal approval. Financing, um, the financing, as, as someone talked about, financing is difficult. Um, our financial model didn't really work uh, just over looking at over 20 year lifetime of the feed and tariff. So we actually looked at the lifetime of the, of the turbines, which we thought was 40 years. Um, and one of the issues was we have both the income from feed and tariff, but we also have income from the sale of power to uh, the Lido or, and or other customers. Um, because we are very close to major major uh, power takers. Um, but we don't know how much power we'll be selling in the future. Um, and the, the table here just shows the range of um, income projections. So we, our income could be between 2.6 to 3.7 million over 40 years. Um, we could make a, 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 Six hundred sixty thousand pound loss if our income was in the lowest range. We could make a sort of nearly seven hundred thousand pound profit if our income was on the higher. Um, so that, in a sense, that's why people are investing as a as community finance because commercially there's a very high level of risk. But people are investing because they actually want to see cli tackle climate change and uh, and see a uh, the turbines built they're willing to basically say well we might actually not make much money on our, our investment um cost of site specific um so uh, things like the geology of the site the access um all those kind of things are uh, make a difference our original estimate was seven hundred sixty thousand pounds when we actually got tenders back we realized it was closer to nine hundred eighty thousand pounds and when we actually the, taking into account all the risks that emerged, we ended up with a cost of 1.15 million. But again, one of the interesting things with our project is that development costs are funded by blender grants and pioneer shares. Uh, and pioneer shares are basically people, again, making uh, um, investing at risk. If the project never developed, they might lose their money. But if the project did develop, they would actually see a better, see a return on their investment. Um, and that I think is a, a model that is still possible. So there are there are grants available for community energy organisations, and there is that pioneer share potential. So that is that is a way of actually getting a project to the point where actually you are cert as certain as you can be at costs. Um, and just the in terms of construction work. So this is just some of the pictures. So. Um, 
one of the things I did not realize, um, like I said, not being having background in hydropower is quite how how uh, labor intensive and capital intensive and sort of just how big everything is. Um, so 46 kilowatt doesn't sound a massive amount until you actually see the site. So that on the left hand side, that's the coffer dam, basically what I call as a hole in the river where you've the, the river has been enclosed, the water pumped out and that's created a, um, and, and then drilled down to um, basically to create foundations for the turbines. The middle picture shows again the concrete work base and that's the space where the, the, the middle wall was dividing the turbines. And then again, working in, working in water has risks um, or working near water. And this was in January, February, 2021. Um, again, high, some of the highest flood levels we have, we had in Reading um, on the Thames for, for years and the site was flooded. We, we were actually flooded out twice over the, over the, the, the construction period, um, but this was a, the, the most significant. But then there's also big steps forward. So on the left with the day, the Archimedes screws lifted into place, um, two screws coming on, on, on the uh, HGV and low, and low loader and trailer. Um, turbine house on the right hand side, you can see that was actually entirely built by, um, again, largely built by volunteers. Um, and then when completion, then the divers are moving the copper dam so that effectively with the removing the obstruction so that actually the, the turbines can operate entirely freely. Um, because, um, again, my involvement was um, very much involved in the financing this all of this i've seen at a distance basically um there are people like there are people people are uh, sophie our chair and tony again have been very much on site pretty much the whole the whole period um and done a lot of work and that's been the kind of thing so the the volunteer we've had a lot of volunteer support um site clearance the fish pass which again you'll we'll, we'll see, see later that was entirely that's built by volunteers we had a, about a 1500 people involved in the cable pool where we 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 basically we had directional drilling to go under the river to take the power to um our site on the other side of the thames um and then we then had the all the sort of the once that drilling was done we then had volunteer team taking the um cables to the um to the to the from the from the turbine to the um, to the um, uh, Lido. Um, the turbine house was again built by volunteers, um, and the, with the, we ran a competition for the mural. The winning design is shown there. Um, the concept was the energy gym, so um, so it's effectively the, the hydro um, hydro supply um, the droplets of water being sort of effectively. Um, the, um, the 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 source of power, um, and one of the, one of the other things I think is also really important to say is actually there's a lot of volunteer work which is not visible. Um, so we had a lot of people who had quite skilled people working on things like um, engaging with our the contractors for for horizontal direct drilling or working out um, in the permissions with Reading Borough Council, those kind of things which are. Off, off, they often quite thankless, but also really, really important. Um, and that's been a big, in, that's made made a big impact in terms of actually keeping in, in the project moving. Um, as I mentioned, we had cost overruns, so we we had rebudgeted in August twenty twenty, and we said actually no, our our, our costs are not seven sixty; it's eight seven three plus contingency, and then effectively we made savings by using volunteers um but if but our savings were completely wiped out by overruns on civils which is again linked to the flooding um increasing turbine costs things like craneage all those kind of things which are uh, things you just don't you don't really realize you get into it the grid connection um getting across the river um power um all those kind of issues 
um, that they had a, an issue about the weir gate and automation of potential automation of the weir um, in order to manage the flood risk for the environment agency, um, which may not, be, which I think we've largely managed to resolve. Um, and then we also had this this figure, the risk mitigation, which is basically our effectively our contingency. Um, and by the end, that risk mitigation was quite small because practically pretty much all the risks had emerged. Um, but obviously, at the earlier points when you were before construction and you didn't know what this, the ground conditions were like, that risk mitigation was a very large figure. Um, and I I found it useful to think about the costs in quite sort of generic terms. So. There's development costs like permitting and financing, um, and those costs can be covered by grant and the, the share of areas. There's costs to ge generic to hydropower sites, so any site you're going to need your, your turbines, you need civils work. But then there are also costs which are site specific, and those site specific costs means it's very hard to actually say as a you can to give a a cost, a standard cost for hydro, because that will always depend. On where on on what's on the position is, so um, the geology of the river the riverbed, um, the uh, obviously the access to the site, the um, access to grid connection, all those kind of things, and then obviously you've got the risks, um, flooding. The risk, the risk we basically our main two main risks were flooding and COVID, um, and if we. If we weren't working to deadlines, we probably would not. Have, we would not have built over over, over winter period because the risks are lower. It was building in spring and summer, um, but we were working to deadlines, so we that's when we ended up building. Um, but even in summer, we have you can still all remember the the, the the flooding we've had in previous summers. So there is never there's you can't say oh it's never you'll never get, if you build start building you'll never get a flood and and you have to stop working. So that's just some of the issues. Um, we are, Reading Hydro is also very clear wanting to make sure that this, the site is used to educational use. So we're putting in educational boards. Um, the turbine sort of at the bottom, View Island is an area of public land. Um, so we are doing things both around the ecology of View Island and also more generally about community energy. Um, so, um, and climate change. The, the work we're talking about is hoping to be used both by school age and university students. Um, and the idea is potentially we able to use, people will be able to do tours of the site and link it to a lot of um, sort of on-site learning ed and education. So um, the site is very close to town centre and Reading Station. So again, potentially, it is something that people could come to from outside the uh, from outside the town, or quite and um, and, and and visit quite easily. Um, the lessons of say we've learned from the project is that you you need to build a team who can work together. Um, like I, you can see from the time times table we did, that it is a significant. Uh, uh, Hall 2013 to 2021 to in to get this done. Um, I think as we've all, all seen from vaccine development, if you've got the funding and the and um, place, you can work. You can you can you can work. Um, you can do things a lot quicker. Um, but funding is one of the big issues. It took us probably five years to get all that that all that sorted. Um, specialist skills required throughout the project. Um, working on the water raises a host of issues, um, which. I've 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 been involved watching reading the the the, the conversations on, on Slack we have about discussing things and with um, complete awe about the amount of um, um, a, a skill and knowledge we've got um, within our team and that's also a key thing is that there's actually it's really good to seek allies um, there's the amount of skill and goodwill including from people like the Environment Agency and 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 sort of and the legal teams within Reading Bar Council and things is has been has been has been very very strong. Um, everybody's still got to work go for their processes, so it can be very frustrating at times. But when we're dealing with people, generally speaking, people have been really really been on side and really and, and really wanting to make it make it make a difference. Um, and that community engagement has been has been an important part of the project. Um, 
the the termination you need to there's no termination required to get the project moving because actually there's long periods where um, maybe nothing seems to be happening but actually you still got to be thinking actually what's our deadline coming up to what do we need to do that um and there is a lasting left at last lasting leg, lasting legacy um those turbines will probably outlast me um and it's something to be proud of um but there are questions there's been reading hydro has been an inspiring project i uh, i'm 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 very convinced but also there are Ha, you can there's always a question that has it been the best use of our time there there has always been dis, there's been discussion on occasion within the reading hydro team about saying well actually shouldn't we do more about energy and efficiency because that actually might be more more effective um and so there's always those questions but um i think generally but what we've done we've we've got something done and hopefully now we're able to move on and 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 pick on, our, on our, another work on that um the whole project has been a lot of learning I think I think everyone who's involved has learned something in some ways um, and there's been many surprises. Um, I'll just show you some of the latest ones, some of the more unexpected outcomes. So on the left hand side, this is our fish pass. Um, this is in the last few days on View Island. So on the top left top side, you can see the reeds, which are artificial reeds, which help the fish pa pass up and down through the pass. Um, and it's also unexpected benefit in terms of providing um, the um, uh, a, a, a paddling a paddling space for local families. Less less um, encouragingly, we had I think this is two days ago. Um, somebody decided that actually, despite the the, the warning signs, that actually it would be use, it would be good site good point to moor their boat to the end of a turbine. Now, what would happen if the turbine had started operating, which it could have done, um, wouldn't is not really something what to think about. So it's the kind of things. Well, actually, there is always you always have to think about. Oh, there are there are, there are always unexpected outcomes, and there are always people who who just who you just you you, you would not expect to, to take the risks they do, but. Um, uh, and that one hopefully won't be repeated. Um, so again, I think uh, the Reading Hydro is a community benefit society. And I think what this is clear is that we've got a large investment based. I think we had probably had um, several, about 500 members um, who invested in the project. Um, the people and as um, uh, people who've invested are members of the society and they control the direction of society and volunteering has been a really important part of that so i think it's i've just i've rattled through this because i think actually what to probably do is a question to answer to people to ask questions um rather than necessarily me to explain too much but um, um that's where I've, that's um conclusion in my presentation thank you thank you very much michael i think you'll see that it's very inspiring actually so when you say was that the best use of your time it certainly looks inspiring um i was going to move on uh quickly to uh, our last speaker but i see that tony who has to leave in four minutes has his hand raised so i'm just going to hand over to tony briefly um so we can hear from him before he goes then we'll move to steve for um, a presentation and, and i'll put pressure on steve to go through quickly so we've got time for questions at the end thank you tony yeah Thanks very much. Hope I'm unmuted. It's a great presentation. Thank you, Michael. I think the point is that it's economic, it's educational, and it's a legacy for Reading. And over the long period, it's going to be hundreds of thousands of pounds going into Reading off the back of nothing, thin air and feed-in tariff. The problem with the buildings on the island wasn't actually the hotel. We did know that was there. I knew it was there and we could see where it was. It was actually a small cottage that was at halfway down the fish pass and we hit the foundations of that and they were incredible. I was driving the digger at the time and we actually had to move the fish pass probably five metres, which is quite a long way to move something when you started to build it. Um, the decisions that we had to make on Reading Hydro have been really difficult. The um, the extension to time didn't come soon enough for us to be able to use it. We had to make the decision to build before that decision of the extension of time for a whole extra year because of COVID came. And I, I don't actually regret that. I think we 
I, I would have gone nuts if I had never had the hydro to build during COVID. So I've been grateful for it. I've done a lot of work on there and uh, we've probably got 50 grand in the bank at the end of the project, which is quite nice to have. Um, there are still things hanging over us like sorts of Damocles, but it's a, it's a great project. It's a community project. It's economic, educational, and, and I've loved it. Yeah, I'm going to disappear. I'm afraid I've got another meeting where I'm speaking. Bye bye for now. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Tony. It was lovely to hear your inspiration, I, and your passion. I can, I can take questions by email afterwards. Thank you. I've put your email into the chat box. Yeah. So Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I'm Go going on. to move on swiftly because I'm very conscious of time and I know we've got lots of questions. Um, so I'm going to move on to Steve and Steve, I'm going to ask you, <laughs> I'm very sorry, if you can be, you know, if you can make this very swift and timely, and I apologise for asking that, but but in time we we no somehow problem. time has slipped, and I know there are lots of questions. Right, you have to. I have to apologise because uh, we're not allowed to use Zoom uh, within the agency. So Michael is going to yeah, I'm going to share screen. Yep. Yeah. I can just get this up. So while they're getting that up, if anybody else has questions, do pop them into the chat box. I've got about five. Um, and we can then, we'll have an idea of how many questions there are to be answered at the end. Right. Okay. Slowly coming up on my screen. Right, thanks very much. Uh, and good morning, everybody. And thanks, Liz, for the opportunity to come and talk to you today. And, I had to power on the role of the Environment Agency. A bit about myself, uh, Steve Kelly, if you stay on the other page, I'll... Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, I've been with the agency and its predecessors now since 1986. And I mean, where's that time gone? Um, working with water resources functions for about 30 of those years in various roles in the Northwest and uh, now for the last eight years in a national head office role. Um, we were just... The agency was established in 1996. I can't believe it's 25 years ago now uh, to protect, to uh, improve the environment in England. Um, and it merged the functions of the National Rivers Authority, uh, Her Majesty Inspectorate of Pollutants and local authorities, uh, waste, waste regulation departments. One of the biggest quangos, if what some people like to call us, about 10 and a half thousand employees. And we do lots of, um, and our biggest uh, bulk of our money goes to flood risk, um, increasing resilience to people, property and business to risk of, of flooding and coastal erosion. We also have the protect the water, land and biodiversity and air quality. Um, and obviously improving the way we work as a regulator can help protect people and the environment, support sustainable growth. As we're all as we probably know, that we're also some significant challenges in a chain environmental climate. Uh, the bulk of money, like I said, has gone into flood resilience over the last couple of years and have just been announced for the next five years. I think we've got about five or six billion pounds to, for, for flood resilience. But there's also a competent, we're the competent lead authority for implementing the Water Framework Directive as well in England. Um, and that applies to surface waters, such as lakes, streams, rivers, uh, transitional water bodies, such as estuaries, groundwater, coastal waters to about one kilometre uh, out or one mile from low tide. And it's all about protecting in inland and coastal waters, sustainable, sustainable use of water resources as a natural resource, creating better habitats for life, uh, uh, wildlife and those that live in around water. Uh, and it's all about creating a better quality of life for everyone. But for the agency's position, first and foremost, uh, the agency is an environmental regulator. It's not our role to promote and champion hydropower within England. We do have a support the development of sustainable hydropower schemes, but we cannot and will not act as a consultant and guide as to what you, your scheme you require. You know, Sam, Simon and the BHA members are only, only too happy to provide that service for, for you. So what do we mean about sustainable development? Um, we're talking about hydropower. You know, by the very nature, hydropower proposals, as with any other proposal to move water from a water course, often require the agency to balance the requirements of developer and protecting the environment as well. You know, hydropower schemes can be complex 
have we, have we just heard and the need to design and manage carefully to avoid unacceptable impacts on you know on the river environment you know for example you know changes to a river can increase the risk of flooding uh, could also impact on on fish fish migration etc you know there can be some quite depleted long depleted reaches especially in high head schemes you could talk about one or two kilometers of uh, of water courses which uh, have got you know a minimal amount of water um as we call it was known as a depleted reach and again not all not all rivers are suitable for hydropower scheme uh, you know where, where where it's not acceptable as inappropriate in its location we'll you know we'll try and advise as a, a developer as an early stage using the best information uh, we've got available to us yeah Move to the next one. Yeah, so the EU established a, a target about 15% of energy consumed in the UK needs to be renewable through the um, 2009 renewable directives. Uh, that was, that's been discussed, um, started in the early noughties and uh, finally came into the EU in 2009. And it, to be honest, that became the catalyst really for the feed-in tariffs, which uh, Simon's mentioned which, you know, obviously you can get the money for to generate electricity through renewable means. Um, it saw a massive boom in developing renewable schemes. And, all you know, the ages will hold their hands up and said, well, it caught us completely by surprise. You know, from dealing with one or two hydropower schemes a year, we're suddenly faced with 90, 120, uh, you know, schemes a year. So it did catch us on the hop, um, caught us completely by surprise. Um, so it, it, you can't write guidance and um, stuff overnight. So it did it had a massive impact on on the agency. But unfortunately, the, you know, as, as Simon said before, the, the scheme was pulled in 2019, and it became a unfortunately it became a victim of its own success. But it's it's like anything; if you provide the means, people will actually, you know, pe people will actually um, do that. And you know we've seen a massive increase in onshore and offshore wind, solar energy from waste, and anaerobic digestion, plant biomass, etc. But you know again, sub substantial increase in small scale hydro uh, during this time. You know, and whilst hydropower might only have a small role to play in increasing generation capacity, it's still it's still an important part of renewable mix. You know, and, and as uh, Michael has just mentioned, it's, it's really an important contribution to local communities. Um, you know, so the, the, the sort of small run of river schemes that you might be interested in, you know, just call them small scale hydro, but it's, it's all part of the energy mix. And as it says in the advert, you know, every little helps. It's not, they're not huge, but every little helps. So you might think, that, what's it got to do with the agency? I want to generate electricity. I often hear, the, I quite often hear the phrase about as, as well. I'm only borrowing the water. I'm putting it back ten meters further downstream. So what's it got to do with the agency? Well, we're we're governed by the Water Resources Act in 1991. Um, you know, an abstraction license is required if water is removed from a source supply, irrespective if it's only ten meters. Um, you know, it'll deprive the the water environment of flow at some point. But an abstraction license gives you the right to take a certain amount of water. You know, it might include such conditions, how you can take the water, any hands-off flow conditions that you need to leave in the river. Um, because there'll be certain times in the in in the year when, you know, the flows will, will go so low that you cannot take that water. You know, the amounts abstracted, any screening requirements you need to, to keep fish and our eels from being drawn into a turbine and amongst other things, you know, how the scheme can operate. You could also need an empowerment license um, if you're altering an existing empowerment within a water body. Um, but it's very, very highly unlikely that would ever permit anybody to construct a new empowerment or barrier within the water course these days um, because of the water frame directive uh, requirements, etc. So it's also, also worth checking with the agency if you're planning on utilising an existing weir uh, and whether we've got any plans to remove the weir uh, to help us achieve good status of watercourses on the water frame directive, you know, and allow fish migration up and downstream. So we do have a big program of removing old 
industrial weirs, which are no longer fit for purpose, uh, which helps um, us achieve that good status. And also parts of our duties under Salmon and Freshwater Fisheries Act, uh, and, the, and again, keep said, mentioning it, the Water Framework Directives, we cannot allow fish passes to be made any worse through the per permitting of any scheme. So that's where a fish pass is may as well may, may be needed and also possibly an eel pass. So it's advisable to build into any design of any new hydropower scheme to include a fish pass. Uh, and again, depending on the type of turbine that's installed, you also may need to screen your turbine to intake, you know, the fish and eels cannot be drawn into the intake. A lot of the Archimedes screw um, turbines now are, you know, have been proven to be fish friendly. I've done lots of trials in the, in the early days. Ask a fisherman that and they won't, won't tell you it's fish friendly, but, um, you know, we've, we have to have fish trials, which means fish pa can pass downstream of a, of a, an Archimedes screw. Um, it's all, it possibly also you need to apply for an environmental permit if you're building or uh, working within eight meters of a main river. You know, and that again will include uh, providing a fish, fish rest, flood risk assessment. Um, you know, so it doesn't increase the flooding potential. It's not, and it's not made any worse. Um, and it, or that also may limit the periods that you're able to work in a river as well. But there's lots of details on .gov.uk if you search for new hydropower schemes, apply to build one. Um, we don't have, we're not allowed to have our own. Um, if you could just go back a minute. Yeah, if, if you just go, if um, we're not allowed to have our own website anymore, so everything, all of environmental information is on .gov.uk, any government department is now on .gov.uk, so we don't have our own um, website anymore. Um, we did produce a hydropower opportunities map, um, which hi highlighted around about 25, 26,000 potential sites with England and, and Wales in 2009, 10. It's, no, it's, it's not supported anymore. It's not available on any web platform, but I've, I have managed to get a cop locate a copy of this. Um, and I'll send it to you, Liz, after this uh, presentation. It's, I'll, I'll hold my hands up and it's not it's not not the best piece of work the agency's ever 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 produced and it's it's it's, it's it doesn't zoom into any particular site but it does just gives a national picture really of a regional picture of uh, size and opportunities potentially um it's certainly so it certainly comes with a health warning anyway okay next slide so you'll often see or often hear doom and gloom stories about hydropower and I've been I've been in many a local meeting when the fishing community have been uproar and fish mincing hydropower schemes you know that picture on the bottom bottom right but, you know this this is this is a thing of the past um, and you see this photograph appear in in most comments on fishing forums etc and yes a badly designed scheme can be harmful to fish we've all worked hard over the last 10 15 years to produce good guidance, improve the design of the schemes, you know, to limit harm to aquatic life. And, and no developer or regulator wants to see this sort of situation happen again. You know, the bottom left picture um, shows a um, shows a hydropod scheme where the whether it's been generated through an Archimedes screw on the right, and water is continuing to flow over the weir. Um, and you can't see it in this one, but there's also a fish pass that's um, that's in, in, in this as well, uh, which is operating. When we, when we issue licenses, we'll include various conditions on, on the license I've said before, and uh, we'll let you know the volume that can divert into your turbine during what times of the year you can take, um, when you must see subtractions due to low river levels of flows, when the scheme can start up again, any environmental protection and mitigation measures you must provide, like fish and eel screens or fish passes, eel passes. How long, also, how long the license is valid for? These are usually tied into a catchment common end date for all abstraction licenses issued within a catchment and a part of our abstraction licenses strategies. So it's a legal requirement for all licenses to be issued with a time limit these days. 
and they're usually for around about 12 years. Um, you can find further details on .gov.uk by searching for abstraction license strategies, finding common end dates, uh, and all based on all river catchments throughout the country. So it's a consistent met method of uh, assessing and um, yeah, giving a quick idea of also of what, of, if water is available. As these are mostly non-consumptive, um, you know, the strategies, if it says no water available, it doesn't really matter because it's, it's non-consumptive, it's mostly going back into the environment anyway. And also it tells you what times of year you're allowed to work in the river as well. Uh, you know, there's some sensitive rivers which are key migratory routes for salmon and sea trout. Um, and key spawning grounds, you may be limited to when you can actually work within a river. And then following the issue of a license would normally permit to specify what's what, what information needs to provide each year. So for some schemes, details of environmental monitoring after installation, um, the type of return of quantities, et cetera, um, that have been abstracted. So there's been quite a number of uh, community schemes, and it was good to see that uh, the Reading uh, scheme, and they do provide a lot of environmental, uh, local community focus and pride. As you know, you, you, you talk to anybody who's got a good community scheme going, and it's the pride that they talk about of how it's brought the community together, how that money is then generated um, for the good of the community. So this one is a Whaley community community scheme on the River Calder. It's near Clitheroe and it was constructed in about 2014. It's got a, a variable speed hydro uh, Archimedes screw turbine. It's 3.6 metres in diameter, so it's quite a biggie. Uh, it's got a peak output of about 100 kilowatts. It's similar to Reading, the £750,000 cost was raised through a local share offer. And any money raised is then obviously distributed through the uh, local local community you maybe just about see on the photograph on the left uh, it also incorporates a fish pass um and that's it allows fish to get over this it's a 600 year old weir this um old industrial weir which is no longer of use so there's plenty of water could you see as well continuing over the weir while they're generating um but obviously there's certain times of the year generating has to stop due to low flows and water levels within the water course. So it's just been factored into scheme, any scheme that you might contemplate. But roll on 12 months, and the bottom right photograph shows the power and unpredictability of our weather and river flows. This was taken on Boxing Day 2015, I think it was, when really heavy rain resulted in about 3,000 properties being suffering devastating effects of flooding. It's quite a significant uh, event that we had that year. Um, and I guess you can see it's flooded there. You can see just on the photograph, uh, it's all completely flooded. But you know, fair, fair dues to them, fair credit to them all. They got it back up and running again within you know two weeks. So on the seventh of January, uh, you know, they, it was up and running again. And then they could obviously take advantage of the how higher flows uh, throughout the rest of that January period. So fair credit to them. And this is the Tors Hydropower New Mills in Derbyshire. This was the first community project uh, in the country. It was completed in about 2008. And again, this has been a major boost to the to the small small town village in New Mills. And they get international visitors coming to see this uh, site as well. And again, this is a good, good large community scheme. There's a nice display outside. Um, Outside, and it's also a big uh, red uh, neon sign that tells them how uh, tells you how much they're generating that particular time. This sure scheme, when it been the first, scheme, was really ho ho heavily oversubscribed when first offered. Uh, you know, you had people investing in shares all over the country. I took a before and after photograph of the site, so you know you can see where what it looked like before and what it looks like after. It's up right on the confluence of two two water courses the river set you can see on the left and the river goit just appears from behind the branch on the photograph on the right uh, this is about 2.6 meter diameter screw i think and it's about 57 kilowatts scheme it's a, you know they've made sympathetic use of a of a derelict mill there and included a fish pass as part of the design as well 
and they've got an automated river level sensor gauge so that when the intent closes, the river um, drops below a certain point. The site, it does suffer though significant siltation problems, um, especially after high rainfall and river events, uh, especially with it being the confluence of two rivers. Um, but photographs where it's completely, completely uh, covered the intake. Um, but again, they get regular volunteers who help to keep the inlet clear. So they'll have a, a debris cleaning day or a couple of days and all the volunteers from the you know local community come, um, come and uh, help to clear that. Uh, the vast majority of this power is generated to a local co-op store. Uh, and there's actually a visual, visual display in, in both the site and in the co-op store. Um, the co-op have recently um, invested in some more energy efficient freezers and chillers. Um, so any excess now gets fed into the national grid. So that gives them an extra bit of income as well. So that's all I was going to say. Quick whistle top store tour that, if, um, you know, we've got further information on .gov.uk if you type in hydropower. Um, and that's, yeah. Thanks, thanks for listening. I'm sure, obviously, I'm sure the BHA can provide further detail, the consultants, etc., willing to provide advice and guidance for anybody. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Steve. That was uh, really inspiring. It was lovely to see the other projects as, as well as the Reading Hydro. And also, I thought particularly what touched my heart was hearing about the pride in the, that communities take when they've done this sort of project. It just sounds like it really brings communities together. It does, yeah. It's, it's amazing, you know, there is so much pride, like you say, of, of, of bringing people together. Yeah. Yeah, bringing yeah. the community together. It's, you know, along with other energy schemes and other community schemes and, mm. yeah. So um, I'm also very conscious of time and I know we've got lots of questions and Richard Tollersbury, uh, Richard of the Tollersbury Climate Change Partnership had a question very early on in our session. So I'm going to open up to Richard and then I invite Dinah Morgan to get ready to ask the next question. Morning, thank you. Um, yeah, I think it's about the, the potential role of tidal power in the micro generation. And, um, I think Simon talked about Cardiff, which obviously was a huge scheme. And in the chat, there's been talk about tide mills, and uh, which are very small. Is there a role for anything in between in perhaps more tidal creek um, situations? Um, and I'm also sort of particularly uh, the comment that Steve made that the agency wouldn't allow really any new empowerment or weir structures to be built. Are, are we saying that actually you would need to have existing infrastructure to build on rather than starting something new for you know, the micro generation type tidal schemes that Tolsbury are, are, are thinking about? Thank you. If it's if it's sort of a, a river estuary type um, thing, it's I think the only way you could use an existing uh, with a normal tidal limit. There has been one or two inquiries recently, um, certainly Chester that I'm aware of, um, Warrington. Just in my old patch, uh, they would use existing infrastructure, but it'd be for the big tidal schemes, which we're talking about on the Mersey. The, the Ribble, the Loon, etc. They would need massive um, infrastructure in place, and I think it's the cost of them that was 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 the major the major problem there, and also the environment impacts. But it's very unlikely that we would, in river, um, allow anything anything significant anyway. Anything over one and a half meters, we would probably not allow that to be built. We would have to use existing infrastructure. Hi, Richard, I think that this is a good question. The, 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 the intermediary, I think, between the tide mill and the kind of in, the large impairments of tidal range is probably tidal stream, uh, where you put in basically a, a wind turbine underwater and it takes the benefit of the energy generated in channels between islands or streams. And that's probably um, the kind of simplest way of looking at an interim solution 
the majority of the kind of tidal range projects that we know about are of the scale where they'll need either an impoundment, um, you know, a sea wall, a new sea wall where the tide comes in and goes out through turbines, or with the wire where there's a, there's a kind of impoundment across the mouth of the river, uh, which benefits from the tide coming in and going out again. A tidal stream would be the logical step for kind of an intermediate solution because the scale of those turbines uh, it can, is, 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 is one that can be graded. So you've got small ones, medium and large, depending on the water course you're going to put them in. Thank you. A satisfactory response? Yeah, I think, I, I think helpful. I think we're probably thinking that was the direction we needed to go. We're not in we're not on the mouth of an estuary, so it would be pure tidal flow coming in and out of creeks. Um, but I think we, we've we sort of come to the conclusion that impoundments probably aren't going to be realistic. So it's going to be about whether we have a tidal stream location that would work. And we'll look at that further. And that, that would make sense. I mean, there are a, di a variety of different types of tidal range impoundment. I mean, there's one, there was one project which was an offshore impoundment, which is a complete circular tidal wall set out at sea that's not linked to the coastline. But one of the important things about tidal range schemes, uh, in particular, there's one in Wales, um, which has got coastal protection. Um, and basically over the past hundred years, that part of the North Wales coast has lost about a mile and a half of its coastline. So a coastal protection scheme actually protects the coastline and stops it being eroded further and up on the wire, natural energy wire, which is a, a scheme that's been planned there, you would have huge flood defence capabilities, which the EA are very keen on um, ensuring for, for, for obvious reasons. Um, I'm going to hand over to Dinah now, who I think has some entirely different sorts of questions. Uh, yes, um, it's uh, very uh, uh, heartwarming, Steve, uh, to see uh, community engagement and everything. But regarding, you know, the magnitude of the climate crisis, to see this sort of incredible resource, two thirds of the world is water, as you well know, being used on such a kind of minute scale when it actually has the possibility to make a big difference makes me wonder why are the regulations so unhelpful with regard to licenses and timeframes, etc. I mean, is this just part of, you know, oil rules and that's how it's going to stay regarding the state of our rivers nationally, where everything is dead and dying. I don't know if you saw the George Montbiot thing about Riverside. I understand the need to protect what is there, biodiversity, but these rules seem to be totally against the production of hydropower. And what is the best way to mitigate the change? And are there any universities or prizes that are actually focused on um, innovation in this area in small rivers for local communities that, that we can join with. All right. Um, I wouldn't necessarily that all rivers are dead and dying. That's uh, that's a scaremongering um, thing. There's some fantastic rivers uh, throughout the whole country. The, the licensing system was introduced in the 1960s because there was a massive increase in um, through the 50s and after the post-war of, of people taking people not people take too much water is unsustainable so the license system was brought in as a protection not only to protect the environment but to protect the people who are already abstracting so but it's not necessarily you know hydropower or power generation is just one one use you know we've got we've got public water supply and we've got to we've got to protect all wall water users and all water uh take us you know irrigation in the in east anglia and lincolnshire so the license system is a is the only way to 
to protect not only existing rights but also the the environment as well. Um, but you know, it's, we are where, we are where we are with it. That's you know, we've got existing rights, and if you know, there, there is there is changes to the environmental um, license system through the environmental permitting regulations. But you know, hydropower is just one use of water. There's many 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 uses of water. Um, as for your final question, I know Lancaster University have been uh, dealing with a, they've got a department that deals with a lot of hydropower and new technologies, et cetera. But um, apart from that, I don't really, I don't know if of any university, I don't know if you do, Simon. Well, Lancaster University, George Aguidis. Um, yeah, is, that's the fellow, yeah. Is one of the most renowned experts on hydropower technology and engineering. It's definitely worth contacting him. I would just say that, um, the, the, the big, I think the biggest challenge for people in hydropower is how they're treated from a consenting point of view when the water that they're uh, extracting uh, goes back into the river. And there is no doubt uh, amongst all the regulators, as in a lot of other business, there's no doubt there are a very small minority of, of people who don't particularly like hydropower. Uh, and sadly, and we've raised this with the EA and NRW and CEPA in the past, uh, they let their personal prejudices uh, cloud their judgment uh, about consenting when they should just following the rules, guidance and legislation that's laid down by the, the Act. Um, it's a very small minority, but it does exist. Can I just add to that, actually, because I had a question for you. Sorry, Penny, I know your next question. Um, but likewise, we... Uh, at CES, we have a partnership with Patagonia um, the, who want to support community energy. So we have a partnership with them. And when I said we were doing a session on micro hydro, they threw their hands up in horror and said, we don't approve of hydro. Um, so I was interested, you know, and, and I can see huge hydro schemes have very different issues from micro hydro. So um, I just wondered if actually if, if any of the speakers would be able to comment on that. We, we, we have engaged and commented on, on the issues that Patagonia have said. I mean, the logic behind the rationale um, is probably based around marketing rather than practical um, dislike of hydropower. We found evidence um, that they we found evidence they've got evidence to support their contention that all hydropower is bad, in the same way that people say all wind power is bad or whatever. So uh, I, I think they, from my personal you not said BHA is it was a marketing ploy rather than anything else. Thank you. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons I put that uh, fish mints in uh, photograph up. You know, you'll see that on ev every forum going, um, and it, it's just it just doesn't happen anymore. It just doesn't happen. And the other thing is that some of those fish aren't actually in the English rivers. They weren't. They weren't. It was not an English photograph actually. No, it's, I think it's Swedish or Swedish, better. Than yeah, it. yeah. Well, hey, photograph. It was very interesting. Can I hand over to Penny Shepherd and then John Laker, you can be after Penny. Hello, this is a question for Michael, I think. It's specifically about the Reading Hydro um, Pioneer mm -hmm. shares. So it's a, it's about the community shares angle rather than the hydro technology. Yeah, sure. Um, which is, um, how are you, how did you and will you incentivize people to invest in the Pioneer shares? given the context that we now seem to be getting from the FCA, for those of you who've, who follow the Community Energy England Lumio uh, board, yes. that, that, um, that basically we, we need to demonstrate that at any point we're paying the lowest interest rates to attract and retain investment um, and we're not, you know, sharing profits between the community and the the investors. We're putting yeah. the community first. Yeah, and I, and I think that's, I mean, that's that's quite clear because, I mean, as a community share practitioner, it's it's clear that we are community benefit, benefit society, and our and our aim is to support the community rather than to make profits for our invest in our members, who are who are also investors. But uh, actually, pioneer the pioneer share offer was very much it was your money is at risk um help but if you don't do if you don't invest we won't get this project off the ground so people were not investing because of the interest they were we did also do some bit of marketing so they had like things like a pin badge and whatever and we had 
so some of the larger investors will be recognized as part uh, of a sort of as sort of people who've made a major contribution to it to reading hydro and getting it across across the, across the line so it was about social recognition and and uh, and about actually getting something to happen that wouldn't otherwise do it so now, you we'll weren't pay you weren't paying a higher interest rate to people who in came fact, in all, first compared happened, to people who came in later when it was lower risk all that happened all that happened was we said if you invest now uh if the project happens we will convert your shares into ordinary shares and you'll be able to get interest on them and we also said for the first few in the first like 10 investors in any category We'll do an early bird offer, which again says if we get if we are able to succeed and, and get to the main show offer, we'll basically pay you 10% interest in terms of shares. But if obviously if we can't succeed, then you will lose you, then your your shares will be pretty much worthless. Um, and that was fine. Now, interestingly, again, because of the um the the government changes on uh because we were talking about energy generation, we were not able to offer any tax relief on that. So it just people were simply investing just because they wanted to get the project over the line. Um, if there are changes on tax relief about on, um, then that might help in the future because that would that would potentially um, benefit from tax relief. But that's not, that was not there. It was okay. it was simply social benefit, social okay. um, investment. But for some of them, you converted the pioneer shares into more ordinary shares. Yes. So you gave them a sort of one time kind of capital gain. Yeah. 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 OK, thank you. That's really useful. Um, and John, I think John Laker, I think from Marlow, it's a. I could not recognize you, John. Yeah. Hello. Hello, everyone. Yeah, I'm from Marlow Energy Group. and We have a river in Marlow and a weir and a drop, so there's potential there. But I have two queries. I know really nothing about water apart from bathing in it from time to time. Um, there are two queries I've got, which may sound a bit daft. The first one is the environment agencies say, as far as I know, you've got to turn off your Archimedes screw if there's low river flow. I don't understand that the amount of water going into a screw and the amount coming out is exactly the same. So I don't know why low river flow affects anything. The second thing is that I've always thought in a very amateurish way that if you have a reasonable river or estuary, you could actually suspend turbines in those rivers or estuaries, a whole series of them because the tide would go in, the tide would go out, the turbines would stop moment, momentarily just while they were changing the tide. Um, that I've never seen that proposed anywhere. It just seems to be a, a very simple way of producing a huge amount of energy. I'll just touch on the hands-off flow and uh, why rivers um, you know, the whole aquatic life, you know, it depends on the size of the weir as well. Um, you know, if you've got no water going over a weir, some of these old industrial weirs have a danger of drying out. Uh, and we've, you know, the next big flood event can get washed away. And that's ha that has happened in, you know, because you're talking to 300 year old weirs in some of these. And also the aquatic life in a weir pool uh, has got used to, you know, has developed quite, quite substantially over the years. So a, it's in their own interest to keep water going over a, an old weir. Plus it also protects the river life throughout the whole stretch of that water, water course. And some, some, you know, can be 30, 40, 50 meters, even more uh, difference between the intake and the out, outflow. So again, you know, to get fish back over, a, over a weir, we need, we need a certain amount of water going over the weir as well. So it's to protect the whole river environment. And we're only talking about the, you know the the, the lowest five percent of a of a flow we call a Q95. Q95. You know rivers are bro broken down into um, a flow regime, so we would tend to put a hands off flow at about Q95, which is probably when a when a turbine wouldn't be able to generate anyway. Um, you know efficiently. As for the other um, thing, I, that's a commercial thing. It's you know I, I can't answer on that one. I don't know if you can, Simon. Well, there, there are prototypes of kind of um, 
in the river generation, which John's kind of alluding to, um, but they don't generate significant amounts of energy. Um, and the challenge is how you fix them securely uh, because they'd have to fix the, the, the riverbed and then the agency would need to have some involvement on how that could be accomplished. There, there is one uh, bomb that is developed a, a thin river turbine that sits on a kind of barge yes. um, and protrudes into the water underneath the barge. Uh, and that's tethered to either side of the river bank. Um, and they've been looking at this for some time. I know that the A have been discussing it with, with Ian. Um, how far that's progressed, I don't know. But the issue there is, um, are they allowed to tether their turbine mounting in the middle of a river? Uh, is it fish friendly? Um, there's a whole load of other issues that need to be covered. So it has been looked at, but you're not going to generate huge amounts of energy in that way. The reason that run of rivers Sorry. hydro is that you're forcing water down a pipe at high pressure, which then turns the turbine and generates a lot more power than just the natural flow of the river. Thank you, Simon. Um, Simon and Steve, I just we have one more question, but I just want to check you're okay because I know we've gone almost ten minutes over time. You're all right for. Um, for another yep. I'll let you off. No worries. Thank you. Okay. So, um, and and Steve, is that all right with you? Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, so over to Robert uh, in uh, Essex. Uh, thank you very much, Liz, and thanks to all the presenters because that's been a really enlightening morning. Uh, and certainly brightened my day, which is pretty blue here. Um, I am a Climate Action Commissioner on the Essex Climate Action Commission, which is just a two-year thing. We're now into starting year two. Um, we are looking at a climate focus area along the Blackwater and Colne Valleys. Um, there are a lot of old mills along both of those rivers. They have often struck me, and I know at least two people, uh, uh, two residents who are interested, and I've got a few others that I'm going to be pinging as well. Uh, whether there was merit in a large community uh, energy scheme that encompassed multiples, or whether there, whether there is, uh, uh, we need to look at them one at a time, I don't exactly know. Um, are undershot wheels, uh, old mill wheels still appropriate from a fish point of view or are they not regarded as very good because there are some passes that uh, are mill races that effectively you could still well with I'm sure a little bit of work stick in a, a an undershot wheel um, and really if, if anybody likewise in Essex is not in touch of the Essex Climate Action Commission um, I hope they will get in touch if they're interested in hydro and we'll, I'll try and get some people to put some uh, stuff on. We've got both websites and uh, uh, Twitter and Facebook and all the rest of it. Try and get people encouraged. Uh, I know there has been a bit of interest recently in overshot and undershot uh, wheels. How fish friendly they are, I'm, I'm not too sure, to be honest. Um, I know we did produce some, some guidance a few years ago, but... Uh, I think with like with any turbine, if you could have a, a side weir for a side side fish pass, that would probably be more seen in a better light. Uh, but I, I would I would be guessing if I, if I made a if if I said I knew anything about the undershot wheels, to be honest. I was wondering whether Simon might have a um, experience of that. Um, Robert, no, I don't. To be honest, there is a there is. I mean. You're in a lovely part of the world, the Blackwater. I, I know it well from a, a previous job. The Blackwater wildfowlers must be somewhere around where you are. I don't know. Um, there's a company called Tide Mills run by a guy called Steve German, who uh, has been doing a lot of work on Tide Mills, and he's probably a good contact to discuss this with. So if you can give me your details, I'll put you in touch with him. Uh, right. I will do exactly that. I can see that Jonathan's with us. Jalalan. Uh, he's he's one of the mill owners. So, okay. you know, I, I'll bounce your note. Thank you very much for that. It's been it's been really positive. Thank you, Robert. 
Jal Allen, do you want to contribute anything as a mill owner? Um, no, it's been very, very interesting. I'm, I'm sort of sitting in the background somewhat listening and learning because having had a mill race running directly adjacent to my property ever since I've been here, you think, and, and, and during the winter months, I see cubic metres of water. There are times when it doesn't even clear the bridge. So the volume of water is phenomenal. But this time of year, strangely, there's probably three inches in the mill race. It's the, 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 the space is still there where they really used to exist. There clearly was a fish pass to the left of it um, because it's, it's, it's beyond, just beyond the bridge, but the bridge is split in two places. I just don't know the feasibility and it's about relative costs and for all, and I sus suspect the majority of individuals rather than community group schemes, it, it, it ends up being a viability in terms of costing. Um, I just, I, I, you know, as I say, I see in winter, I see tons and tons of water going through per second, thinking what a remarkable source of energy going to waste. I just don't know quite how you harness it. Well, it's a very interesting point, and I get this um, question a lot about um, why don't we make more use of the water we have in, in the country, whether mm -hmm. it's seawater or, or rivers. Um, and part of the problem is that the legislation around what you can do is quite defined to start mm -hmm. with. Uh, the report that Steve mentioned the EA undertook in 2010, I think it was, into feasibility. It did list 26,000 sites, but actually when you drill down through that data into terms of what is actually allowable, uh, feasible and affordable, you end up with about two and a half, that, about 250 sites. Yeah. Um, so there is this, this, this level of restriction. Other countries um, may have different approaches to this we work very closely with the International Hydropower Association um, and the biggest um, form of hydro development outside the UK will be in pump storage whereas it's not the case in this country so the public god bless them think that hydropower is great uh, and they can't understand why the country doesn't make more use of its water resources and I think Steve uh, has you know, just explained why there needs to be some form of regulation so we don't contaminate watercourses or abuse them, which is understandable. And the same applies in Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland. Um, so it's a case of a, a very fine balancing act. Um, and I don't think that'll change. Although, going back to your talk about tide mills and um, mills in general, there is a, a group called the South Somerset Hydro Group which is 250 mill owners. Um, and it might be worth, ladies, in the future point, getting them involved in one of these um, discussions. Thank you, Simon. That's really helpful. Um, we, I think we probably ought to be winding up. Um, we have had a question about how climate change effect is going to affect hydropower um, potential. And my guess is talking, given we're talking about uh, more uh, extremes, that potentially it could it could work work other ways. So when we end um, uh, more flood events and 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 less and less and more drought periods when you can't use hydropower, but it might also be you're getting it on a uh, there's more water over a longer period. But um, I don't know if there's been modelling done on that. It's something maybe we'll we'll ask to people to pick up on out, out after this meeting if there's any any work being done on that. Um, and just on on it's really good to hear about the Essex the Climate Action Commission and the uh, potential for projects in Essex. Um, Community Energy South is is working on the Pathways project to support community energy organisations, and we're really interested to work with anybody else who's in who 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 wants to pick that up. Um, so uh, myself and Nicola, who is also on here as a call as, as mentors, are happy to help work with organisations. And again, we will we'll call on the BHA um and their their expertise um and help organize help um uh, organizations to access funding to make to make to try and make these projects and some of these projects a reality um thank you very much everybody we have run quite significantly over um 
and it's good to have your uh, patience and tolerance for the, for that and hope you found it interesting. Um, and um, again, as I've mentioned, the, the um, recordings will be will be made available and um, we will save the chat and um, sh and share any sort of comment contact details and questions people have got and with, with, with responses where we where we can. Um, thank you all and um, enjoy the sun. Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you, you Michael. Very nice to meet you all. Thanks a lot. Thank you.